Hello, KBMD Health and Gut Check Project fans. I hope you're having a great day. It is now time for episode number 61. I am joined by my awesome co-host, Dr. Kenneth Brown. And we have a special guest today, Mr. Marcus Ruark. Ken, why don't you go ahead and fill us in here? So this is going to be a super exciting show. Uh, today we have Marcus Ruark, and this is something that is very, very important. It's important for my patients. It's important for anybody that deals with with all kinds of diseases, but I'm thrilled to have him here. Thrilled to be here. Marcus, thank you so much for coming in. Marcus Ruark is president of Good Blend Texas, which is headquartered in Austin, Texas, and proudly sells cannabis products that are cultivated and produced right here in the Lone Star State as one of only three state-licensed medical dispensaries. Now, Marcus, I saw your bio. This is super cool. You have a very interesting background. And prior to joining Good Blend, you received your electrical engineering degree from Stanford. Then you received your master's degree at Stanford. And I keep saying Stanford because Eric and I both have kids which are applying for college. And when I see Stanford, that's the uh, sort of crown jewel that most parents want their kids to go to. And they like tennis players. And they like tennis players. <laughs> you received your master's degree at Stanford in management, science, and engineering. Following this, you went on to serve as a captain in the U.S. Air Force, where you led your team in the National Security Agency followed by Advanced Systems Division of U.S. Space Command. That's crazy. And <laughs> following that, your bio discusses a lot of other really fascinating things that I want to get into. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about what's not in your bio. Okay. Tell me about you, family, what's going on with Marcus Sure. Well, we just had a big week in the Ruark family. We took my daughter to college, which you just alluded to a little bit ago there. Nice. She's going to San Diego State. Nice. Pretty excited about that. Um, but also, you know, it's a little bit anxious and first first kid out of the nest, so to speak. So that's exciting. And then my son started up eighth grade, first time back in school since sp spring of his sixth grade year, right, when everybody went home for COVID. So very exciting there, too. And he's trying out for football. So Fingers crossed. Right on, right on. That's a heavy plate right there. And so uh, San Diego State, that's Trojans? She's a Trojan? Aztecs. Aztecs, yeah. I'm learning it too. Nice. <laughs> oh, hey, that's, that's in Southern California. Never mind. Sorry. So the family, your background, there is this huge section in your bio where very clearly you have an entrepreneurial spirit, you have leadership skills, you are willing to push the boundaries a bit and try some different positions, technologies. Can you give me what led you up to this? Absolutely. So <laughs> after I got out of the Air Force, I was very interested in joining the, the high tech scene that was happening in San Francisco. So did that right around, actually not the best time for that because it was right around the bubble years where there was a big crash back in 2000. But that being said, um, really got interested in bringing new products to new markets and bringing new benefits to customers who maybe hadn't seen those benefits before in the past. So very exciting, did a lot of startups, founded a lot of companies. And then at some point I crossed over into healthcare. So st a startup in the healthcare space. And it hit me then that as rewarding as I thought it had been doing startups in high tech to do it in healthcare was even more special because not only are you starting a company, but you're actually helping people, right? We were helping doctors treat patients better. We were helping patients have better outcomes in their, in their hospital stays. So it was really rewarding. And at some point after that, I was able to join a company called Fluence, which you probably saw on the, on the resume. But they were in the um, LED lighting space. And I started there to help out with the customer experience uh, for their customer base. And I learned that their customer base was primarily in three segments, uh, customers who are companies who are growing produce, companies who are growing flowers, and then cannabis companies. Mm -hmm. And can imagine which one of their segments was probably the fastest growing. It was their cannabis customers. And so that was entirely new to me, the, the, the cannabis world. And I, I, as you guys have, I dove deeply into it, the endocannabinoid system, the, the benefits of cannabis and learned about cultivation and creation of products and distribution, all that kind of good stuff. And right around, I guess it was the spring of 2017, Texas announced the grant of the first couple of licenses for the Texas Compassionate Use Program. And when, you know, I, I reached out to one of the companies and said, yeah, I think I, can, I think I can help you guys here in Texas. And so I came on board as president of Good Blend Texas at that time. 
And that's fascinating. So, I mean, obviously it was just natural as a natural progression. You ended up seeing that there was a need. It was certainly new to you. Sounds like maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're inspired by things that you don't know enough about, but seem intriguing and could help people. I'm still learning nice. uh, and so much to learn in this space still, but, but it ends up, it's a great match for all that because it's, it, it's, it's technology, sure. right? It's, it's horticulture and it's, it's help, helping people at the end of the day, right? That's what, that's what we're here to do is help Texans. So as an electrical engineer, I get that you were drawn to the LED space, but then getting drawn to healthcare and now more of a, I mean, what would you describe your position at Goodblood? Well, I, I'm, I'm leading the entire Texas team here, uh, everything from cultivation to uh, product development, formulation, packaging, distribution, uh, working with physicians, working with patient support groups. So pretty much everything, setting strategy, product roadmap, and, and trying to build a great culture for the team here. So one of the things that we talk about in our company is the why. The why, the underlying reason why all of this is happening. Because if you don't have a solid why, then what you're describing, nobody else really will believe in that. But it sounds like you found your why. Even if you haven't defined your why statement, you found the why. Uh, well, I can define it for you. It's we are empowering Texans to find their well-being, right, through natural medicines that our patients say work. And it's, it's, it's so rewarding. Now, we have a, we have a group of, um, we have a role at the company called mobile wellness coordinators. And these are the folks, it's probably one of the hardest jobs at the company. You have to be knowledgeable about cannabis, the endocannabinoid system, uh, talking to patients. So you have to be a bit of an extrovert, right? You have to be able to talk to patients. Um, but you also have to drive across the large distances of Texas mm -hmm. to deliver medicine to patients' doors. So you also have to be a bit of an introvert there to be happy listening to podcasts while you're driving. They have the best job in the company, though, because when they're making that second delivery to a patient, they get to hear how that patient did. They get to hear the patient testimonials, and they're incredibly rewarding. Nice. And it's, I feel really almost envious that they get to do this, but they're, they're so nice to come back and share their stories with us after they've had these amazing conversations. So were you with the company before they ended up having their first dispense of their – uh, certified. You know. Yeah, I've been with the company since 2017. Mm -hmm. um, we served our first patients in early 2019. Okay. And what was it like? What was the anticipation like to get your first patient that had been referred in and, and, and bringing those physicians on board to do that here in a state that didn't do it before? Well, I think you predict my answer. It was huge and hugely rewarding. Like I said, uh, it's it, th this the testimonies we hear are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And as we've come to market with even a wider set of products, different ratios of CBD to THC, different terpene profiles, we're able to help more people. We're able to give prescribing doctors more choices and patients more choices on how they, how they help themselves. Well, it just seems like it would be a really cool opportunity to paint a picture of how you feel like you're going to be able to deliver something that maybe a physician does it feel like that they've got a total grasp of because that's why you would offer an alternative? And then now you've recruited them to go not in just a new novel way, but prior to your launch wasn't really necessarily well embraced. How hard is it to get that message and get physicians to want to buy in to do that? It is still a challenge today. Sure. And one of the reasons I'm so excited that you invited me here today is because one of my number one missions right now is to try to get the word out, to increase awareness. I suspect... Uh, we, we don't have a random Texan here right now, but if we grabbed one, walked outside in the heat and asked them if cannabis was legal in the state of Texas, most likely they're going to say no. Right. And even for the patient groups where it is legal right now, most of them don't know that it's legal. So our number one job right now is creating awareness, growing the number of Texans who are aware that they have this treatment available to them. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate being on a show like this to help get the word out. What I think is so cool is that somebody with your pedigree has chosen to do this and now finding out why you chose to do it, which is you got into healthcare. You had the opportunity to do these, these other companies where it could have just been about financial reward. Right. But once you got in and saw the impact that you could have, that then you chose to do this with that message of we're going to empower people to take take their health over. What was your statement again? You're going to empower? Empower them to take charge of their own well-being. Empower them to take charge of their own well-being. That's something that I try to do as a physician all the time. And so many times it's limited because of the insurance plan, because of lack of funding, because of lack of efficacy. Sure. So... 
Yeah. I'm thrilled that Texas decided to do this because we've been waiting to see this happen. I've talked to my colleagues in other states where medical cannabis is legal, and they tell me about the success that they're having with their patients. As a gastroenterologist, when I look at, let, let me just pick a patient population, like my inflammatory bowel disease patients. I'm open to discuss things. I, I'm more of a functional type person, so I will ask these questions. And if somebody has Crohn's disease and they're between the ages of 18 to 40, I just say, are you using cannabis for your health? And they'll stop and be like, yeah. How did you guess? Yeah. I mean, they just go, yeah. And because they're on forums, they're talking. And I said, well, it's pretty exciting because I'm, I think we're headed that way with Texas. And I think that we could make this so that you don't, so that you can have control over this, so that you can actually empower your own health with this, with products that are meticulously cultivated, that have certificate of analysis that you don't question, which is what Good Blend is doing. Right, right. Well, the other, the other message I'd like to get across, and it ties into what you just said, is that it's actually easy to do. It's easy to get into the program. So, right, n- not only do they do Texans not know it exists, but if they do, they probably think it's incredibly difficult to mm-hmm. get a prescription and to get product and to be able to afford it. And that's, that's another message I would like to leave with folks is that it take a look into it, right? Go to goodblend.com because it's actually easy to get signed up and, and get a par- be part of the program. Oh, we're going to get into all of that. I, I have wanna, a feeling. So I want to get into the... I'm, I'm, super, so I I'm like, I, where do I go? I love... <laughs> I love talking to people that have been there, done that, that have degrees like you have, that have seen so many things. I want to know, you know, what Good Blend does, where it is. But I think one of the most important things that people have to realize is that you've got very, uh, I've been to a program and I've met the doctors that showed up to the program and I've talked to pediatricians, psychiatrists and pain doctors here in Texas, here in Plano, not just, I'm not going very far out. And they told me the effects they're having on their patients. And these are smart people. Somebody like you, also extremely smart. We start validating this whole industry and start shedding that kind of negative feeling that people have carried over over the years. Obviously, other states are a little more advanced, but even my patients. Today, we had a 65-year-old woman that is quite miserable from an autoimmune disease, and she just said flat out, would you care if I started smoking weed. And I'm like, not only do I not care, but I'm going to send you to a doctor because one of your diseases qualifies you, at least right now, on this fairly limited set. And we'll talk about the different programs which are easy to get into and all these other things. And she just completely was like, you're kidding. And I'm like, no. And these are, then you start briefly talking about ratios and it's not about, you know, smoking yourself so you can't move on the couch. Go ahead. I just want to add to that because where she is and where she finds herself, and this is why I think what a company like Good Blend really bridges a gap that needs to be bridged, and that is the reason why she asked or was hesitant to bring up the use of marijuana is because probably up until a certain point, she felt shameful in trying to find a solution. And finally, she worked up enough nerve to finally throw it to Ken and say, do you mind if I do? So how long had she been sitting on the fence before she finally worked up the, the nerve? Because we've seen her before. She's not a stranger to the clinic. To work up enough energy to be able to do that. And what I think is great about a company like Good Blend is stop waiting. We want you to feel better. And there's actually an easy pathway to do so. Is that kind of how you see the the access there? Absolutely. It's, and it's one of the reasons that we try to have a a vast selection of products that feel a little bit less um, intimidating, mm-hmm. right? So we'll probably get into that later too, but everything we can do to help folks out, I mean, I, I'm actually kind of feeling bad for this person, right? Because like you said, how long had she been sitting on that and not sharing that? And she could have been helped a lot earlier. So yeah, and, and te- I, Texas is making really good strides there. Every two years we have a legislative session and mm-hmm. every two years we've been expanding the program. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. It's, if you are knowledgeable about this, so Eric and I got heavy into the uh, CBD yes. area when CBD was still, people were being arrested. Well, in not Tarrant even that County. far from here, yeah. Tarrant County, just over in Fort Worth, they were getting arrested. And I'm like, I call Eric, I'm like, there's another person. I'm like, what are we doing here? I'm like, it's CBD, <laughs> I know everything about this. It's the endocannabinoid <laughs> system. This is perfect. And when you start talking about, I'm like, this person has an endocannabinoid deficiency. 
They've got these chronic diseases. We are just putting Band-Aids on all of these things, including pain meds. If we can get their endocannabinoid system back to balance, it is something that they need. If I have an asthmatic that shows up and they're wheezing, and I say the only thing that, you, that, that is allowable under your plan, the only thing that's allowable in this, uh, I'll take it back one second, um, Simone Biles. Oh, yeah. All right, so Simone Biles, uh, this is, and this was shared, I didn't, uh, I haven't talked to her, but uh, it, it was viewed on a couple different articles that seemed pretty credible. It makes sense, regardless, it, different countries have different rules. Japan does not allow ADHD medication to be mm. taken. She's been on ADHD medication for most of her life. So she goes to the Japan Olympics, and nobody's discussing that she couldn't take that. It's a banned substance in the country. It's an accepted substance in the Olympic Committee because it's an exception, because they understand that. So she goes there, and everybody's like, well, she's lost her train of thought and everything. So imagine if you can't get the drug that you need or the product that you need, and it's available right there but somebody's putting a wall that's right there. If you're an asthmatic and you're wheezing and I can't give you Ventolin inhaler to open up your bronchial airways, because guess what? Ventolin and bronchodilators, it has to be an exception if, it's, if you're on the Olympics. Like you have to get it exempt, otherwise it's considered a enhancing thing. There's things like that that are on that, you know, that, that's why you get NSF certified for different things Correct. and things. So this is one of those deals where I'm like, if you're a diabetic and you need insulin or if you need metformin and you can't get that, when I look at some of my patients and I'm like, oh my gosh, a beautiful balance of your endocannabinoid system may correct 90% of what you have going on and we can take these eight drugs away. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah, so I have, I have a theory on this, which is that, well, and partly this may end up being preaching to the choir, but it's my understanding that the endocannabinoid system is not well taught in med school, if at all. And if that's true, that means you have to learn it after you graduate. But it also means you may have some skepticism about it. It was only discovered in the 1990s. Yeah. I mean, how come we couldn't do better and discover it before then? But that, okay, so it's discovered in the 90s. Um, it's really important, right? And I've heard you guys talk about it a lot. But it is the I call it the it's like the conductor of the symphony. So it is conducting all the other systems in our bodies and it's telling that one to get a little louder or that one to slow down and it keeps everything in balance and a word you guys use frequently is homeostasis, right? It helps maintain that. And yet I, I was in a doctor's office the other day with uh, my daughter had to get a COVID test before being allowed to go to San Diego State. Um, and on the wall, this doctor's office, you guys probably have it too, is the systems of the body, mm -hmm. right? It's got the skeletal system, nervous system. And I look pretty hard on that poster and could not find the endocannabinoid system. So to me, that kind of said everything. It's not surprising and it's unfortunate because it, it, the end result is what do we have now? It just simply becomes ignored and then it becomes taboo because if it's being ignored, then maybe it's not acceptable to talk about. If it's not acceptable to talk about, then you have patients who are fearful for bringing forth an idea for a solution and then we're, we're just slowing recovery when in fact, I mean, I'm not an advocate saying that THC is going to solve everything for anybody. But that doesn't mean it won't work for someone. We've talked about this before, that I believe I'm a gastroenterologist. I focus on the gastroenterological system. There are neurologists. There are endocrinologists, cardiologists. We will have an endocannabinologist because that is something that people have to get on uh, or to get on board with. There's when you look, well, first of all, a, a quick side note, I suggest everybody after this is over, go to Good Blend's website. That website is great. It Thank is you. filled yeah. with so much information, so much great information about the history, about why it became sort of tucked under the rug, about how it was manipulated on a political level, and then ultimately about how all these other cannabinoids are involved. So it's... It, I don't know if you you can't see it. It's way over there. But I purposely put um, I put a terpene in there. We got limonene being diffused right now, so we could stay mentally clear. You know, terpenes being involved in all this. So as an endocan as an endocannabinologist, we're going to get to the point where we'll be like, okay, well, tell me what you. Oh, perfect. It sounds like you 
need some assistance with this, this is probably the blend that you need. This is more of, you need a more CBD front heavy with a mercine terpene to calm down. And maybe and a, some, one thing in the morning. And one thing the yes, yeah. absolutely. And the fact that it's all natural and, and does that. Um, Oops. Do you want to repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> he we just were, fixed my... We who knew it didn't pop right back up? I know, right? <laughs> um, no, I, I just said that uh, I think an endocannabinologist will eventually be able to fine-tune what people take based on the terpenes, and, and, and you mentioned... Yes, I mentioned maybe one thing in the morning, right, to get you ready for your day, and another thing in the evening to help you get ready for bed. Absolutely. And if we could get to that point where people are doing this, then they're like, okay, or as needed, um, the delivery systems. It's like, okay, I'm a little overwhelmed right now. I'm feeling real anxious. I just need a little something to cut this off and non-addicting, all these other things. And Eric can attest to this. When we see these patients and we cringe every single time, how many people show up, young people, you look at their med list and you're like, holy cow, that's Xanax. Mm -hmm. That's three different antidepressants. You got a muscle relaxer. You're like, how? Maybe, that? maybe Ambien. Well, oh, if for, you want to see. Yeah. So much Ambien, so much other sleep medicines. But let's look at the addictive potential of some of these medications Ultram, opioids, and benzodiazepines. It's almost criminal what has happened with these addictive medications that we know they're addictive, but without anything else to give them. And you have a patient that's there. And as physicians in healthcare, I ultimately want to help people. And I have given opioids and I have had the discussion with them. I'm like, I understand you're in a tremendous amount of pain. I need you to sleep. I'm willing to give this to you for a very short period because I feel like if I can get you to sleep, your pain will be markedly better and we can stop these other things. As somebody who, well, it's now not that recent, but five months or so ago, I had my first real neck injury where the pain was, and I've redefined my pain scale kind of thing. You know, like when people go, oh, that's an eight out of 10. You know, I really thought stubbing my toe was eight out of 10. You redefine it. And we've talked about him before, but Wade McKenna, an orthopedist, uh, you know, he told me, he's like, listen, I'm going to, I don't, I don't like, you know, hitting you with a bunch of opioids and stuff like this. What we really need is to calm the muscles down. I'm going to give you a long acting benzo for four days, take it for four days, stop taking it after that because your muscles will calm down at that point. There was a plan. There was a plan to get me on. There's a plan to get me yeah. off. And he purposely said, I don't mess with these opioids. Are you kidding me? As an orthopedic surgeon. And when, if we could sit there and say, okay, you, patient comes to me, I'm a, I'm a primary care doctor, and somebody has a significant injury, and say, tell me what the biggest thing about this. It's the anxiety of knowing that I don't know what's going to happen. Okay, then you give a blend, which is more effective on the anxiety. Tell me what's happening here. The pain keeps me up. Okay, let's do this. We now have the opportunity to treat these symptoms that ultimately may or may not need some other intervention, but we know it's not addictive. We know that it actually has, and now we're going to get into the science of it, but we know that it actually has these different properties that help decrease the inflammatory processes by blocking PPAR gammas, by blocking these different pathways, G-coupled proteins. We can get all sciency about it. but. The reality is I don't do that with my patients. I say, tell me what it is that's bothering you the most. Let's see if we can give you something for that. That's the beauty of what you're doing right now. Good Blend has the ability to take these natural molecules in different ratios to help in different scenarios. Totally agree. I mean, it's actually, you, you reminded me, it's kind of dis disheartening to look at a patient's med list when they come in. And there's a bunch of things kind of like what Ken just described. And we're almost used to the polypharmacy or the, or the multiple meds that are all listed there. And truly knowing that a natural alternative could probably reduce that load. So we're playing less of this chemical warfare with this patient because it's almost, and you were kind of hinting at it earlier, it's almost like you're taking one thing to balance out the other thing that I've just gave them this new thing. And you're almost always chasing rather than actually treating and then 
and, and, and letting them be themselves. So we, we are getting that feedback from patients, which is that once they've been on our medicine for a while, their, their drug list is decreasing. Sure. So they'll tell us, I've, I've, we've had, we have been able to stop these three things and now I'm down to these things, or I've been able to re- reduce the dose of these things. Um, and if you, I'm not, I'm not asking you to do this, but if you want to go Oprah on me and ask for some <laughs> patient testimonials, I, I may, you know, they're tear jerkers really yeah. in terms of helping and what things we're able to do with people. Well, uh, you know what? Yeah, I do want to go Oprah on you. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about uh, one where somebody, it made such a profound difference in their life that they couldn't hold back. Yeah. So um, there, there's a, there's a patient we have that has terminal cancer and that was a hard, just that you guys have these conversation. I, I don't, it was a hard conversation for me to have, but he had a great outlook on his life and he started taking our medicine and he was able to cut back on his opioid use and the way he described it to me was, it's not just good for me, it's, re- it's really good for my family. Because on opioids, I'm a zombie. And with your medicine, I, since I've been able to decrease the opioids, I can be myself around my family in my final days. So it, they're hard stories, um, but happy stories. Um, another a mom said to us, um, her son had so many seizures a day that, and he had so many anti-seizure medicine. He was kind of just there, right? But on our medicine, he was able to stop taking some of his um, anticonvulsant medicines. And he said, this is one that gets me. He says to his mom one day, mom, I have feelings. Wow. Wow. That's, I mean, what a, what a crazy thing to have to lose as a kid, the ability to basically (laughs) participate in life because it's being taken away from you by a chemical that, up and until now was necessary because you you obviously can't just sit there and suffer from seizure activity over and over again. That's that's dangerous in and of itself. Right. But not knowing that there's a better alternative is honestly it's criminal. It's criminal not to know that there's a better solution than just taking anticonvulsants to control. I'm assuming epilepsy or something similar to right. Yeah. So that's so that brings up a really good point that mom, I have feelings. These medications have side effects. And the side effects that most people don't talk about as a gastroenterologist. The, the, the pharmaceutical medicines. The pharmaceutical yes, medications. Yes. Correct. So I get so many of these patients that are on polypharmacy because so many of them have um, antiparasympathetic, meaning they affect the gut. Almost all of them do, yeah. one way or the other. Oh, I, I have diarrhea. When did, when did that start? Six months ago. I see you're on Zoloft. When did you start Zoloft? Seven months ago. Hmm. I have so <clears> much constipation. constipation. What's opioids. going on? Oh, you're on the opioids. Oh, I've got... They all... They're... I'm fully aware that there's completely... These are necessary drugs. But my job... When I... During residency, some of us were chosen for... Uh, basically treating older people. So I went to the older people clinic. And so... Is my, that the uh, technical term for it? That's the technical term for it. <laughs> okay. the, the older people clinic. Yeah, OPC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in, the layman's term is gerontology. But uh, yeah, but we call it the older people okay. clinic. Yeah. <laughs> OPC. I would sit there and as a resident, I'd look at these lists and I'm like, you're 90. You're still here. Why do we care about your cholesterol that has this effect on this and this? Why are you on this? Why? My sole job I viewed in that clinic was to just get people off medicines because the side effects at some point are just completely uh, yeah. outweighing that. And that was just a lifetime of going to this doctor, that doctor, the cardiologist is going to give this, gastroenterologist is going to give this. They just keep adding up. They just keep adding up. Yeah. Somebody shows up with a list of this. None of these drugs have ever been conducted in a trial where they're all together. What happens then? We don't know. Well, I'm dealing with that now, and I've got a 90-year-old person, and just every time they'd come back, they'd be more alert. More. Alert. If you made it to 90, you're a baller. You've done it right. Yeah. You deserve to drink what you want, smoke what you want, <laughs> eat what you want, do whatever it is. And they would love that. By the time they would, they'd, get, they'd start having fun again. And... It was just about getting them off their drugs. Hmm. You kind of hit on something, though, and maybe you've seen this because you said that you've seen a, a show or, or two, but something that we've had, we have hit on is lifespan and life expectancy is, is just a number. But what's way more important, truly, to enjoy those numbers is to have a good health span. 
and to be able to function and participate in life, if you're going to live it, you may as well be involved in it. Right. How do you? How does? Um, how, how does your company view health span in relation to to that? I would say in, in, similar to the the things we've been talking about, which is if you can if if there is if there's an opportunity to live a higher quality life, right? And there's a natural way to do that and to get off some of the pharmaceuticals that maybe are causing some of these side effects and you can live a happier, higher quality life. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for, right? It's kind of what I talking about well-being. That's exactly what we're here for. So it, it, you gave two quick testimonies, one obviously about someone with ep- epilepsy and then one from somebody who was suffering from terminal, terminal cancer. cancer. Yes. What other, what other uh, ailments do y'all kind of focus on as it stands right now? The so there is a treatable conditions list in okay. Texas, and it is it was created by statute. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, as you know, it started out in uh, 2015 as intractable epilepsy. That was the only treatable condition. In 2019, the program was expanded in a significant way, where uh, a lot of new conditions were added. So terminal cancer, uh, autism, ALS, Parkinson's, spasticity, uh, a whole giant category of conditions under the headline incurable neurodegenerative diseases. And that has a list of about 300 things underneath it. So it was this pretty significant expansion. And I would say across all those, all those treatable conditions, we're hearing positive testimonials. That's fascinating. And actually I had glanced at it. I don't think that, uh, that Ken and I have spent any time on it, but I did notice that there was autism. And I don't know that you do have a testimony or not, but it's definitely something that's near and dear to this guy in our research just through polyphenols, but he's, he's made no mistake about it. There is a play there with, with uh, cannabinoids as well. I'll let y'all yeah, know. I'll give you my, I'll give you my take. In fact, uh, we work with a, a great asset. She's been on the show before, Angie Cook, and she wrote up an incredible, which I have yet to publish, partly because at the time people were being, I mean, Texans don't even, I, I, I can go around right now and talk to my patients about CBD, and I've got CBD all over my office, and they will be like, oh, boy, no, I'm not into that. I'm, and I'm like, well, let me explain it to you real quick, and let me explain this. Do you have any chronic condition, whatever? They're like, well, yeah, I totally do. Well, and then they end up you know, purchasing it and saying, yeah, it made a huge difference. And it comes down to that rebuy rate. So as a business person, we know that I've got a almost – 50% rebuy rate on Atron Teal, and this is like, you know, worldwide. Yeah. We know that that works because as if anybody's ever been in the pharmaceutical industry, I prescribe a drug and they come in and I'm like, did that work? And their trials, the, you know, the studies show it's 8% better than placebo, whatever. So it all comes down to, does the person want to come back and purchase more? That's to me, that's the, that's where the rubber hits the road. My move towards autism became very personal when I had a patient that brought her son in and he had become, I'm, I'm an adult doctor. He had moved on from pediatrics to adult. And she said, he's becoming almost impossible to take care of when he eats, he cannot communicate. He flails, he gets almost violent and he's, you know, he's 16. He's, he's becoming a young man and this mm-hmm. is getting really bad. I said, listen, I don't know a whole lot about autism, but I do know that you said when he eats, let's treat his gut. Let's fix his gut. And I'm just now getting into something where I believe it will play a role. And I put him on CBD. And now looking back, we're going to look at this. I'm going to be sitting in a lecture someday, and an endocrinologist will have the exact thing to give that person. But right now, that was best I could do. Mother shows up three months later crying, and her son is communicating, not high level but she's like he's like hi and he's talking and I'm like how do you feel and he's like you know good and she's like this is crazy it's been 10 years and I've not seen this person I'm like I don't know if it was the fix in the gut I don't know if it was the CBD regardless I think it's both and that's where it came in so then Angie did this incredible write up and maybe we can team up with your people to get it published but it's like 50 pages long it's super sciencey it's all about autism and the effect on the endocannabinoid system. And when I go to my colleagues and they say there's no science on this, mm-hmm. we share a Mendeley account. Are you familiar with what Mendeley is? Yeah. So we share this 
the repository of journals that are up, that are published, and we've got a whole folder on autism, a whole folder on CBD, a whole folder on cannabis, on, on cannabis, and the science is there. Animals to humans. The problem is the science in the United States is not here. The science that is recognized by our journals here, because. And we talked about this. People don't realize that it was approved. If you're going to study cannabis, and uh, Michael Pollan was talking about this, the author Michael Pollan was talking about this, that the cannabis, which is approved by the FDA oh. to be used in studies, yeah. is it comes from one place. <laughs> yeah, one, one place, some yeah. crap place that's like 60 years old. Yeah, yeah it's been around. Like, shit, kind of shit marijuana. It, it just, it's, it's not uh, indicative. It's not similar to the kinds of medicinal products that sure. people can get today. Yeah. Exactly. And this is what, and let me, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, this is what all sanctioned uh, and allowed U.S. research is done on is basically just this one lot, correct? Or from a federal perspective, okay. I believe that's federal correct. Yeah, that, I should, being I should clarify, said, yeah. that being said, uh, the very exciting news in this most recent legislative session, nice. uh, the statute, they added to the statute that Texas can start its own research program. So. The uh, Department of State what? Health Services for real, for real. That's so dishes, oh, that's huge. Yeah, they're they're writing the rules right now, and uh, yes, it's very exciting. So Texas Cannabis Research did, is part of the Texas Compassion Use Program. Did not know that. Did not know that. And it's, it goes beyond the treatable conditions list, right? Sure. So the why else do research? So the, so the research, whoever the research institution is, picks what they want to study. I need people to hear that. Say, say that a little bit closer to the mic. Which part? The, uh, <laughs> the research, uh, so the Texas Compassion Use Program is introducing a research element. And the Department of State Health Services is writing the rules right now. I think they're even posted for public comment. Uh -huh. And it's going to happen. And so the research, wh whoever the research institution is, and they provide a list of who can qualify, you pick the condition you want to do research on. Uh, you do have to find an IRB. Uh, but it's sky's the limit. Oh, my gosh. That makes me so excited. That just, that turned into hope for my IBD patients. Yeah. So, and just to so, clarify. And you get to use our products. You don't have to use the, the federal cannabis. Yeah, okay. I have been, uh, that is exciting. Having you on just for that one thing. I hope my partners listen to this because GIA right now is, we're getting close to a thousand providers strong and in the state of Texas, basically everybody in the state now is part of this one group. To be able to power a study like that could be fantastic. I have just I thought that it was completely prohibitive. Man, gotta love Texas. Gotta love Texas. <laughs> <laughs> just saying we're gonna do it in Texas if the feds don't want us to do it. That's awesome. No comment on that. <laughs> um, to your point about uh, autism, I've had the I've been very fortunate to be able to attend uh, two medical cannabis conferences in Israel, and then one was in L.A., and there's plenty of studies out there about autism and THC. For sure, and that's so. what this 50-page review yeah. that Angie put together, put a lot of sweat and tears into it, and I, it's something that we should probably team up with some of your scientists to update it because it's about two years old. Yeah. But I was shocked reading it. The level of science, the level of information out there, and the amount of benefit that it can actually do and the correlation. So for me as a gastroenterologist, the correlation that when the endocannabinoid system is off, it affects all systems. But in my opinion, all health begins and ends in the gut. If you don't have a healthy gut, you ultimately affect the brain. And we've got, we've done podcasts on this where we can show that Neuroinflammation or chronic inflammation affects FAAH, which is the enzyme that breaks down your own endocannabinoids. And when you lower your anandamide, which is the one that you know is your low level keeping you there, it's your that, body's own equivalent of THC. It's your body's own equivalent. And then on the flip side, when you have 2AG, which is the spotlight, if that's getting turned on all the time, that's your that's like a that's the other portion of the endocannabinoid system. The difference between a Stanford grad and a simple country butt doctor in Nebraska is I've used the same example of the endocannabinoid system, but you referred to it as a symphony conductor. I referred to it as a traffic cop. Yeah. <laughs> They're both good. I could say mine's, you know what, 
I won't say it. Yours is, <laughs> yours is more elegant. I'm yeah. gonna start using that from now on. Yeah. Ele- elegant was exactly the word I was gonna His, say, so I'm glad you said it. His is refined, and yours is quickie mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, on your point about the importance of the gut, and if you haven't uh, checked out this research, please do. I think you're gonna find it very interesting. There's um, one of the leading researchers in the field of cannabis is a Dr. Ethan Russo, mm-hmm. and he has a. I think he calls it. I may begin this wrong, but the grand unified theory, but of course it spells out gut, but it's all about the, the, the brain gut, um, connection and with the endocannabinoid system as, as a key part of it. And you've, you've addressed this in previous conversations, but they're all tied together. One of my problems that I have had, and I'm curious how you and your salespeople have dealt with this. It's the person that... <clears throat> I don't know how to say this. I'm enthusiastic, and it took me a long time. I've read Vitamin Weed, which is a great book. I forgot the other Michelle, Michelle Ross. Michelle Ross, that's it. Michelle Ross wrote that. She's a PhD. You know, there's Goldstein's book. Uh, but these books are great. But I had to read them a couple times the first time I started getting into it before you start going, because it's, it's a different language. It's, that's why I think we're going to have an endocannabinologist. My problem is when I have somebody, it's that the vomit of knowledge that I have to keep myself from doing when somebody is like, what's that? And you start getting into it and you're like, what's the endocannabinoid system? So I've always, I'm a little bit curious from a business perspective, how you as a company get into that naive, let's just start with the naive doctor that says, well, I don't know about this. They start with the... You know, yeah. You know, I want. I'll, I'm kind of curious. You, know, you may not want to divulge everything, but I, I really kind of want to know how many practitioners throughout the state are actively participating in this program. So the state publishes some data about okay. the program. The most recent data is from July, mm-hmm. and there were over the, approximately 500. Oh wow, that's up. much bigger than wow, I thought. That's bigger than I thought. Yeah. And to be a prescribing doctor, you have to be a board certified specialist, as as you are. Um, so it's it's not every doctor you have to right you have to be board board certified and then the patient the patient count as of end of July was right around 70 7500 7500 that may not sound like much but it's growing 10% every single month well it'll every be one of those month. things every single month and this is in the in the official kickoff was 2019 right for the, the first, first patients the first patients were actually served in 2018 okay not by us but okay so that is so tip of the iceberg because as a clinician, I went on once I found out, uh, you know, one of your salespeople that had has known me for a long time as a friend and he got involved with this knowing that I'm involved with CBD and understand the endocannabinoid system. So first thing I did is I tried to sign up. Well, my specialty is not listed. So as a gastroenterologist, I'm not listed as w- currently. Interesting. Currently. Because when I did the whole thing and went through it and tried to, do, I couldn't find that. And then for me, it was a little daunting to say, well, I'm internal medicine is there. I'm board certified internal medicine, but I, I really practice 100% gastroenterology. And I did not want to false, under any false pretenses, as this is, because it's just a matter of time. It's a matter of short time. So discussing that from a business perspective, what can I do? as a physician who's very interested in this, help some of the legislation bring in other, let's start, I've got a ton of questions about the, all these little things, but help bring in other specialists. Are there, I mean, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know, like committees or I don't know. Well, hopefully a discussion like this helps, right, for starters, right? It was one of the reasons, uh, I mean, Hopefully doctors watching this who are board certified specialists who are intrigued and, and have heard how much this can help will apply to get into the program. It's very simple for doctors to get in. Um, you you just provide your Texas medical license number, I think, and your board certification number and the Department of Public Safety checks those two things. And that's pretty much the extent of it. Mm-hmm. You become registered. And, and at that point, they very much leave things up to the doctor. That's one of the great things about the program is oh, that's great. they trust the doctors. So in this case, not knowing enough about that, I'm like, well, I'll wait till my specific specialty. It just, there was neurology, oncology, pain, internal medicine. 
I, I, there was a lot of specialists. So if there's a physician listening to this, go check it out because more than likely you're there. I'm just saying that gastroenterology was one of the few that was not listed. I can I can certainly bring that up with them and ask. Um, you know, if we can get if we can get that specialty added, I'm surprised it's not on there. I, that was eight months ago, nine months ago, yeah. something like that. Maybe it is. I haven't checked recently, but it's probably well, COVID. It, it, it should, I, could be. One of the reasons I think it should be is, and I, I actually learned this from you in our very first phone call, one of the treatable conditions, which I don't think I listed before, is called spasticity. Mm-hmm. And it is unlike everything else on the list for your very intelligent audience. They know as soon as I say that, they're like, which one is not like the other? Spasticity is a symptom, am I correct? And the, everything else is a sort of a disease or You're a condition. exactly right. And you informed me that much of what happens between the the mouth the top and the bottom you know by the way for those who don't know if you get on a phone call with a gastroenterologist <laughs> it can get like it was unexpected i was not expecting to have that conversation in my day if i'm on the phone i'm like whoa because we went top to bottom or you did uh, but apparently it's all a lot, a lot of its muscle and yeah. there can be spa- spasms in that muscle spasticity in the muscle and that is a treatable condition straight it's, up it's nerves innervating muscles and the muscles, if they go into spasm, create tremendous pain. And if you're ever worked in ER and you ask an ER physician what's the what's some of the most common complaints, it's abdominal pain. Now that can be all the way from mm-hmm. a perforated bowel appendicitis, but a lot of times people just get labeled, oh, you've got a bug or IBS, and then they get sent out. That's it's a huge chunk because it covers so much territory. So, yeah, if the spasticity, if we can get the spasticity handled, I could help so many people. My SIBO people. So if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, one of the reasons why you have so much pain is because the bacteria produce gas, which stretch the intestines in a reflex. The intestines try and contract back. That's a spasm. This is reminiscent of our phone call together. This this, this is, (laughs) yes. (laughs) Except you were eating at the time. I kept saying, you know, when somebody poops like this, you want to make sure that. <laughs> well, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious about if if a, and then you you put it in these words if a if a interested physician or one on the fence even were were considering this and you've already talked about what it takes to get approved. So let's talk a little bit about what's the experience like to be that practitioner. Uh, for one, uh, you write a an opioid or what, something that has a highly addictive property, or even if it's classified that way, it's called a controlled substance. And then in Texas until recently, we always came with a paper triplicate. I mean, there was a, there was a form to do so. So what's it like? What's the process for the uh, writing of the prescription and the experience going through your company? And what does the physician see? How is it dispensed? What's the follow? You know, I guess sure. you can see where I'm going with that. Sure. A challenge for a patient can be finding a doctor who can prescribe. Okay. We've tried to help with that by, we have we have a virtual clinic on our website. So if you go to goodblend.com, you can actually see a doctor through telehealth. Mm-hmm. It's one of the very great things the state of Texas has done is enabled telehealth for this program, which is super exciting. Uh, you can see a doctor through a telehealth appointment, or you can go to, to a doctor's office and see them there. Uh, they're either either the doctor will diagnose you with one of the treatable conditions, or you bring your medical records from a different doctor. Who's, who, for instance, if you had a patient in, in their chart and you put spasms of the gut or spasticity, or um, they could actually take that chart to another doctor and get a prescription. That is fantastic that to is. know. So, as somebody who's a Learning the, and I'm I'm risk averse. I'm all these things. I just don't want to. I want to make sure that I follow the lay of the right. law, which is why I stopped when my own specialty wasn't there. That is fantastic to know that I can say, look, I can. Right now, I'm not comfortable doing it, but I truly believe that you could benefit from this. Please go to this website, set up a virtual visit, show them this note, fax them my clinic note. Hundred percent. Oh, easy. That's, that's easy. Fan. This, this, that's awesome news because it actually allows a physician who's oh. on the fence or is worried about blowback from maybe their own partners, they can now safely dip their toe in the water and say, look, I've got a pathway for you to get we, there. We have doctors that do this all the time. Oh, my gosh. So, that is great. That's huge. You're exactly right. When I first started doing CBD, one of my partners grabbed all my all my pamphlets and said, <laughs> if Brown wants to sell weed in our clinic, that's fine, but I'm not taking part of it. Not a joke. Not a joke. <laughs> so, uh, but, and then if I actually, <laughs> you know, because there's just this much misinformation and, and 
the people don't educate themselves. That is awesome. Because what are we talking about here? And you said it, you started off this interview. We want to help people. And the people we want to help is the patients. And you don't care if you're getting the cred as the doctor who is being in this position to do that. This is about the patient who comes in and says, I hurt or I can't get over right. this. Or I, as you said with the, with the kiddo, I can't feel. Let's get them on a route to do so. If you're uncomfortable doing it, it's fine. Let them take what you found with them and then and then head over to, uh, to your website. Not to digress really quick, but when you said that, I can feel for the first time. Imagine your child who you love dearly that has never been able to express love can then express that because of this? Because you got them off these meds? That's living. That's living. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. Um, oh, and I know you didn't mean to digress, but I am curious, though, yeah, once, I'll once they write that I'll script. continue the journey for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, everything, the patient record for the program lives on uh, a Texas website. It's the it's called CURT, C-U-R-T. It's the Compassionate Use Registry of Texas. A prescribing doctor would go into, it's, it's an online service, but you go into, you log into that service, and then you create a new patient profile mm-hmm. for your new patient, and then you create a prescription for that patient. And so your prescription, you, you have, they give ultimate flexibility for how you want to write this prescription. The, the ones we recommend are flexible to give the patient flexibility. So you would specify, here's the milligrams of THC mm-hmm. I'm, I think w- would work for you over a an X day period. So this prescription is going to exist for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. We recommend 90 days because I think one of the things we've learned from the, the, um, like the, the CVSs and the Walgreens of the world is if you can write that longer prescription, you're going to get better compliance for, for the second round of uh, dispensations. But so 90 day prescription, this much THC in milligrams, and then you have to specify the means of administration. You can get very specific with that. You can say uh, it's got to be a tincture, got to be a gummy, or there's a, a box that says, I think it says other, any means, other, any means. Mm-hmm. And then there's a notes field. And so what you could say to a patient is, so you do all that and you could say, I, I, I recommend you start with this in the morning, this in the evening. And if you want to dabble with, you know, try, try this and see how it works for you. You can try that too. So that all exists in an electronic record. The next step then is for the patient to contact Goodblend. And then we, they tell us their identifying information. We pull up that patient record and that prescription, and then we are able to, to dispense against that. One opportunity for improvement in the program, and some doctors do this, some don't, is if you think about it, when the patient leaves that appointment, you know how this goes. I, I, can't, I can't remember really half what a doctor says when I leave that appointment because it's a high-stress time. And when you get home, you have trouble remembering what the doctor said. So we do recommend you give the patient something that says, here's what I'm prescribing you. Or you send them a follow-up email and says, Here, here's the prescription I gave you. Otherwise, they don't remember what sure. you prescribed. And then we're the ones reminding them, hey, your doctor prescribed X, Y, and Z. But that's the process. So you see a doctor, doctor enters the prescription into the Compassionate Use Registry of Texas. Mm-hmm. The patient contacts us. We dispense against that. In terms of getting the, our medicine and products to patients, we offer a lot of different ways to do that. We started out as 100% a delivery model. So we were delivering to patients' homes. Uh, we've recently added the the ability for patients to come into certain doctors' offices and pick up their what they've ordered. And even more recently, we've added the ability. It's almost like a miniature retail experience, but we bring unassigned product into the doctor's office, and a patient could walk right out of the, your appointment. You've entered their prescription into Curt, and we can they can shop right there and, and buy what they want. And then so a one stop shop. Let me clarify that really quick. So you're saying that a physician can actually have product in their office and they can sell it directly to the patient. We do the selling. But okay. Yes. Okay. We are there in the in the lobby or wherever wherever we are, and the patient comes in and, and they they see what we have to offer, and then they they buy what the prescription says and it's take like a it pharmacy home. extension. Essentially, essentially, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I just uh, and <clears throat> one, one small caveat uh, on this journey so far. So uh, much like j- just so that people don't think that a, that a physician is just guessing at what the milligrams are. Mm, whenever a new medi- whenever a new medication comes out that isn't cannabis, they utilize uh, representatives to go and 
educated physician. It doesn't matter if it's a new blood pressure medication. Uh, every blood pressure medication that you've ever taken has had a representative go in and basically detail a physician on that. So I would imagine that there is a detailing process on best practices, things to look for, cues, correct? When Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Sure. Yes. You're, you, you would, a physician would not be guessing. Yeah. Uh, we have, we have dosing guides. Um, for instance, if you want the prescription to be 90 days long and you're thinking about prescribing X, we have a recommended daily dose and just multiply by 90 and you sure. put that in, into the prescription. So, yes, we we provide all of those sorts of collateral and educational materials. And that kind of stuff, I mean, that, that's and that's not unique just to cannabis. I mean, we do that literally with every single pharmaceutical that has ever been rolled out. Physicians, practitioners need to be educated on it. So this and I love this because this is no different. And except for that it is because people have worried away from it. And I mean, I, I think it's it shouldn't fantastic. be different. Right. And we're getting to the point where it's not sure. I, I hear you. Uh, w- one other way it's similar to the way prescriptions work in the pharmaceutical side is if a patient were to call us or, or ask for something that was slightly different than what you prescribed, mm. then we have the ability to contact the prescribing doctor and say, Hey, the patient is interested in this it's slightly different than what you prescribe. So for instance, let's say you, you check the box for tincture and the patient decides they want to try our 12 ounce beverage or a patient wants to try gummies. It might be in the same ratio, might even be the same dose. It's just a different means of administration. Mm-hmm. We're able to contact you and say, are you okay if the patient gets this instead? And then we just write the note into the, look like a little hamster typing there. We just write the note into the, uh, <laughs> into the prescription. But I mean that ha- that happens with generics and name brands and, and regular pharmaceuticals too. So I mean I think I think it's awesome that y'all, have, it's it's completely you're legitimizing something that should have been legitimized a, a very very long time ago. I love that y'all have that in your model. I think yeah, it's completely help. transparent. Yeah, I I love how that's that's going on. Also, let's uh, since you brought it up several times, let's talk about these different means of administering. If you have examples, like what what are some of the things that you that you've seen your practitioners have success with that some of the clients, the patients seem to like, because a lot of people don't realize. A lot of people think, oh, I I don't. I just have to smoke it, right? That's the only thing that it, that it's there for. So, this is a medicinal product. What are some of the ways? Sure, you can sure. It? So we started with uh, we started with tinctures uh, back in the our first uh, first couple months, and um, and that was when the program, what in early days of the program. Uh, it, I, you know what? I should back up in a second and say w- one thing to note about the Texas Compassionate Use Program is we are capped at a THC maximum currently of zero point five percent. By weight, if you know your, if you know the world of cannabis, you're thinking that's a very small amount of THC. It goes up to one percent starting September first, based on most recent legislation. But one of the things we realized is that if depending on what the product is, depending on what the means of administration is, zero point five percent can actually be a lot, right? The heavier the other ingredients are, the more you can get in there, more THC you can put in the product and still stay below the 0.5% limit. So we had tinctures for a while, and then we moved on to lozenges. We were the first company in the state to come out with an edible product like that. It was lozenges meant to kind of dissolve um, in your mouth and and for absorption of the cannabinoids. Um, After lozenges, we came out with gummies. We're the first in the state to come out with gummies. Uh, We have one-to-one CBD THC ratio gummies, and we have five milligrams THC straight up. And in those gummies, we've got different terpene profiles. We've got a sativa profile, an indica profile. That that's giving our doctors some prescribing flexibility. Mm-hmm. We see, you know, common common uh, prescription might be take the one to one gummy uh, that's uh, sativa in the morning because that can be more stimulating, and it's not. Uh, you know, it's a one-to-one CBD THC, so you have those working together. But when you're getting ready for bed, take the five milligram indica gummy, which can can be relaxing and can help you sleep. So um, that, those gummies really help with uh, prescribing flexibility. We then came out with lotions, so we've got some topical products. Uh, which now again, you have to have one of the treatable conditions. But if you also have some other symptoms that could be helped by our medicines, then you're in the program. Sure. So you have access to everything once you're in the program. Uh, we launched medical capsules, uh, which is a really nice, very precise dosing uh, product for doctors. And then most recently, we were the first. By the way, all of these were first in the state. Uh, we, were, we most recently launched our 12-ounce uh, beverage, cannabis-infused beverage 
which so, I guess I, since I brought pop props, I might as well show the prop. Um, it's empty because, right? Well, no, we don't have a prescription. <laughs> we don't have a prescription. Yeah. <laughs> but um, all these are getting great feedback. I'd say are the most what, popular. What are some of the other products that you brought? These are all empty. Of course, there's our gummies here. These are the Texas Orange Sativa 5 milligrams. I got one of our lotion, one of our topical lotion jars here. Nice. Um, tincture. Thank you for asking that question because one of the things I should mention is one of the things we did launch, this is our dream tincture. So it's it's designed with a terpene profile for evening use. Yeah. But one of the things we also did with this tincture, and it's a, it's a different bottle, but we, we added, Blurry. no worries. <laughs> they can go to our website and see a nice rendering of the, the bottle. But one of the things we did with this launch of the dream tincture is we had a companion tincture called Dream Plus CBN. So we were the first in the state to come out with a cannabinoid that was not just THC or CBD, but we also added CBN to the mix. And okay. uh, the best way to describe that is it's the sl- sleepy cannabinoid. It's known to encourage sleep. So you get your, some THC, CBN, great product for uh, if you're having trouble with sleep onset or sleep duration. So one of the things that I ask all my patients is no matter what, if you're coming in to see me, you got an issue. How are you sleeping? And It's incredibly important. Uh, holy cow. It is the biggest I'm going to call it a life hack. If you're not getting proper sleep, then you are not able to, number one, clear your brain because you're setting yourself up for dementia later in life. You're not able to have the motility in your intestines. You're setting yourself up for SIBO. You're not able to downregulate the inflammatory cytokines, so you wake up with pain. Multiple studies have shown, which is one of the things that pisses me off about hospitals, you operate on somebody and then you poke and prod them all night. You don't let them sleep. And all the pings and the bings. All the pings and the bings and everything. My wife uh, just went through a procedure, and that was one of the things I told the nurses. I was like, here's what we could do that would be really cool. Let's just turn off everything. She's totally healthy. She's not going to shut down on you. You guys have her monitored at the nurse's station. Why don't we turn off all these alarms here? Yeah. Because if she can sleep great, then we know that that's going to help. So anything to help with sleep that is not, you know, you brought up Ambien in the very beginning. We know during sleep studies, if you look at Matthew Walker's book, he describes how Ambien doesn't let you get the proper sleep. You think you sleep, but you don't. And when you have something natural, which Mother Nature has that in the whole plant, if you just increase a little of the CBM, I think that's brilliant. That's actually the first time I've ever heard of a product adding that, and that's really exciting. So as you alluded to in the beginning, my, my time at college was a long time ago, but one of my favorite courses in college, and this is probably going to sound lame, was a class called Sleep and Dreams. On its face, that probably sounds like a pretty easy class. It was taught by Dr. William DeMent, the discoverer of REM sleep. Hmm. And we learned all about the, as you can imagine, he was very passionate about sleep, including various theories that it might have been behind the Challenger, the Exxon Valdez, right? Lack of sleep can cause big problems. And so ever since, I've been very passionate about sleep. Oh, that is awesome. And, I am, that is one of my huge things. We talked about the products, and I just kind of had a random question about manufacturing. But when y'all have, and it's homegrown here in the state of Texas, so when y'all get your cultivation, uh, crops vary from, from crop to crop. How easy or how difficult is it to, number one, make certain that you've got good, clean, no pesticide uh, uh, product, number one. Number two, the milligram count. That's going to change probably. I don't know if you all do an indoor grow or an outdoor grow. Just kind of speak to that if you don't mind. Sure, sure. So you are correct. Everything we do is grown here in Texas. Mm -hmm. We have a variety of different genetics that we grow. We then extract the cannabinoids from the cannabis plant uh, and... I, you may be able to correct me on how accurate this is, but I like to think of extraction as similar to how we get coffee, right? If you're making coffee in a Keurig, you're putting the beans in there, right? And you're running hot water through it. That's similar to what we do. We run uh, supercritical CO2 mm-hmm. through the, the dried plant material. And we're extracting the cannabinoids out of that. There's a lot of steps after that to purify and distill it. But essentially, we're left with a lot of different base ingredients, all natural, that came from the plant. And then we can mix and match those to create these formulations, the different terpene profiles, et cetera. Uh, and then we run everything through a wide variety of tests as specified by the, um, the Texas Compassionate Use Program. No, that it makes, it makes sense. I mean, it's beautiful. And in fact, since we started and once we became educated on how we wanted to source our own CBD back several years ago, 
you already mentioned it yourself, cleanly extraction, or I'm sorry, cleanly extracting is, uh, is, is important. If you care enough about the health of the end user, then you need to make certain that your process is clean. Yeah, and you referenced, um, you referenced pesticides. We, we use plant-based natural oils. Mm -hmm. And uh, even more interesting, uh, perhaps, to your audience is we use what, what are called beneficial insects. So there is a company out there That's that cool. ships nice. us live bugs d specifically designed to guard the plants. And they can live in the soil. They can be flying around. But they, they, these, these beneficial insects, they kind of kick butt and they kill anything that might be bad for their cannabis plants. So it's a really natural that way is, to grow. Is it a symbiotic cool. relationship? Do they, do they thrive just simply because they're around cannabis themselves? I, I don't, I'm unaware. They survive because they're eating the, the, any bad bugs. Oh. That might get <laughs> it's just the lure. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. There's a lot of that going on in mycology right now also where they're trying to find, you know, different fungus species which mm -hmm. can protect plants and things like that. I love that whole natural protection, bio-warfare, get rid of those pesticides, get rid of those fungicides, and use use natural things. That is really cool. I love I'll say this, that. though. Our, our uh, head of cultivation, when, when, that, when that box of beneficial bugs shows up, he's like, we got to get that inside out of the Texas heat, right? So but it's, they survive. They survive the shipment, and we get them in there in the plants, and, and they protect them. Nice. That is cool. I have a couple business questions for you. I was thinking about this. As somebody who, and I know it's probably not your job, but as you being president of this division, you have to talk to somebody who's doing this. In something that is still considered fringe, because I struggle right now, like everybody else, I'm trying to hire people for my office, and it's hard to find good top talent for different positions. <laughs> When you're in an industry like this, where in Texas it's still a little bit confusing, you can't just go on Indeed and say, you know, cannabis. We actually do. You do? Yeah, we re recruit using Indeed and, and all it, the other recruiting services. And, that, and people see it and go, that's the company I want to work for. Absolutely. And, wow, that's awesome. I thought there'd be more difficulty with it. We, well, you, you have talked with our provider advocacy team. You know they are elite, but a lot of times they're ex-pharma because they wanted to get out of that world and, and be something natural that can still help patients uh we yes we we're, we get a ton of potential employees who, who want to be in this industry and almost almost all of them say they want to do it because they've heard stories or they have friends in other states or they've moved here from other states and they've seen how beneficial it can be i mean the reason that we met marcus was because seth was motivated exactly like that yeah exactly yeah 100 percent. yeah that's awesome yeah that is so cool. I think there's a couple really key things here for me that I took away. Number one, the research thing is so exciting. I cannot even contain myself because that is something that yeah, we have You could have just come and just said about. that and walked out. Just, yeah, just, just <laughs> grab this mic and be like, Texas research, pow. Is that the Costanza thing? Where yeah. You, sorry. The Costanza thing where you hit the joke and you just you got to yeah. <laughs> Hey, I like how you worked in a, a television or movie reference there you go. saying that, that you didn't know any. I heard it was a requirement. Sure. <laughs> I was told. Prepare some of those, Marcus. I, the other thing I was going to throw out, sorry, Ken, but is uh, – I was interested in the fact that you were, have been so open and uh, really from top to bottom on how this process should feel if someone were new. I didn't know if I was going to be able to expect it from someone who formerly worked with NSA because <laughs> that was worrying me a little bit. I didn't know if we were just going to sit there and you were just going to smile the entire time. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure I came across a little bit nerdy, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> can't talk about a bit of, uh, much about the NSA. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> don't worry. They're no. still probably listening to me, making sure I don't say I like anything. how you say probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that is really cool as a physician, which I want all of my colleagues to hear this, is that we you can write the note, send it to an experienced doctor. And I say that because... There's going to be a lot of my colleagues, like, I mean, Dr. Item, Dr. Malik, who really want to get involved. Definitely. If they're like, I don't know enough about this. I'm like, well, this is the doctor. I mean, like they would say things. And me, I would say this. Since I'm, I'm all about CBD, I'm learning about THC and combinations, I would love to send it to an experienced doctor that says, listening to your symptoms, I feel comfortable that you need this THC amount and this CBD. This opens up a whole world of other doctors being funneled in to somebody that has more experience 
saying, this is just like you said. I would like you to take this in the morning, this at night, just like I do when I do supplements and when I do things for any type of gastrointestinal symptom. I've got a unique way that I like to use this. That, those two things, the research and the fact that I can lean on somebody with more experience is very cool. Right, and as, as if you start doing that, you'll get to hear the returns coming back from your patients, and that'll give you more confidence that you might one day do yourself, right? For so. sure. You're basically, and this has happened with just about everything, and I think every doctor should do this. I think any time that you utilize a specialist, you should read the note, and you go, oh, that's how, now I'm feeling more comfortable. I'm seeing the pattern that's going on here. And now I have my primary doctors call me, hey, I noticed that you treat SIBO with this. I treated this person. They're not getting better. Should I try something else before I send them to you? Or And that's what right. I'm going to be doing to these people. That's right. great. Yeah, if you put specificity in the note, they'll be good to go. That opens up a lot, a lot. And I'd so if you have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, the stuff that I like to treat, share it with your friends. Tell them that this is an option because this will be really, really exciting to help people. I've got, after we get off here, I've got about three hours worth of calls of patients that have had stuff you know, happen that I need to get back and see how serious it is. And I'm going to tell them all, I'm like, man, hang in there because I think we've, I think we're going to turn over a new leaf here real shortly. It's a really good point about sharing too, because the main reason why we have this available now in Texas is because there's been patient demand and there's practitioners willing to find something new. So if either of those describe you and you want to find something new for your patients or you've been suffering or you, you're a family member or a friend of someone else who has, this, this message needs to be heard. It needs to be shared and understood. And I would be remiss if I didn't add another huge change that's coming September 1st. It, this may not be as big a wow for you as the research program, but on starting September 1st, PTSD becomes a treatable condition. And all cancers become Whoa. a treatable condition. Oh, Whoa. So this is this Whoa. is it. now. You mentioned I'm a veteran, so this is huge for me personally. That that's oh. coming September first. There's a lot of excitement around this. Yeah, and I, I, did oh. I did I bury the lead? No, 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 no that's no. actually that's a really big deal because awesome. That's huge. So I treat a lot of cancer. Uh, clearly, not as much as the oncologist, but as we can start. Um, I work with whenever I find a cancer. And unfortunately, we're finding cancer in younger people. And this is not something that I want to be involved with and I want to be able to help them. And if I can get my colleagues, I got my little team, I got my colorectal surgeon and I've got my oncologist and we just kind of share these people. A lot of times I find them and they go around. If all three of us are on the same page with this, I'm, and I know that will be, that's a big deal. It's the... The comfort zone of doing that and then the comfort of having maybe we find somebody that we can funnel into here locally and we all learn from that one person and watch what they do. If that's changing on September the 1st, and I, I really, I even wrote this down as one of my early notes. I didn't want to go there just in case it was going to really put you on the spot in, in this type of arena. And then stop me if it does. But I'm passionately concerned about the people who have given their time and put their lives on the line to fight for our country only to go to a system which I believe fails them multiple multiple times and that being the VA when they're just they deserve better so can you speak to a little bit about maybe what the VA will begin to consider in this arena or if someone happens to be a veteran in Texas specifically I don't really know I, I can't speak to the VA in general. I know that we're we are getting and the prescribing doctors we talk with are getting a lot of calls from veterans mm -hmm. and there's a lot of excitement around this and there's even there's even patients getting signed up. We just can't dispense till September first. So this is happening. Uh, anecdotally uh, and I, I can't remember if I mentioned this in the beginning, but one of the other states that we operate in is Florida. And Florida is is the biggest medical cannabis program in the United States. So a lot more opportunity for testimonials coming out of Florida. Um, and it's a, it's a bigger treatable condition list. Actually, Crohn's disease is on their tr treatable conditions list in Florida. Fantastic. Um, we hear amazing things from veterans, but also that they appreciate that they can enter a program like a medical cannabis program mm. to improve their, what do you call it, health span, um, their quality of life over maybe what they had gotten from prescription drugs. 
I mean, the, and that's the goal. I mean, because oftentimes in the VA, my, and it, it, you know, I should say anecdotally, but the experience that I, I encounter with patients that do suffer from PTSD and they happen to be a veteran is it's almost always trying to be solved by a pill. It's very rarely a, a one-on-one consultation for them to get counseling and, and be able to understand why they may be suffering through what they're suffering through. And in certain instances, it sounds like that they may even be threatened that if they happen to utilize cannabis on their own, then they simply are foregoing some other type of therapy or whatever. Knowing that this is going to be an avenue opening up, I think is a huge win for people who deserve better. Period. Absolutely. That is awesome. That is so cool. I I feel your passion in this. I can tell that you I'm fairly chose. low key though. No. It's it's a it's a very distinct slow burn that you have going on. <laughs> that slow burn. That you're really going to make a difference here. I appreciate and that. And you you know the science. You've got the business acumen, but most importantly, you realize the difference it's making in people. You see what you need to do, and I feel very comfortable with where this company is going yeah. and its structure. What you've laid the foundation. You're making it the model that medical cannabis should be. And as somebody there that's been kind of waiting to do this, I feel way more comfortable really getting involved in, and, and obligated to help my patients. If this is available, just I don't want to be a hypocrite here. This is something we said it before, just like you said, when you see the difference that it makes, I know patients that need this. I've just waited for the right time right. to do it. And I think meeting somebody like you that has chosen to leave some lucrative fields to take this on, to get this out because of all the lives it can change, including veterans, including people with pain, including opioid addiction, including all these things, polypharmacy. We covered a lot of ground here, but I just want to thank you for doing that. I want to thank you for taking this on and coming on the show and being very genuine, being very open and honest. And I'm really proud of everything that you've done. What's the, what's the preferred route for people to look at more about Good Blend for you? Go to our website, goodblend.com, or you can go to tx.goodblend.com. If you go to goodblend.com, they'll ask you to pick your state mm-hmm. and also say you're older than 21. Um, but if you go to tx.goodblend.com, tx.goodblend.com, you'll be able to see all of this stuff. Can you see this little hat? <laughs> yeah, by the way, these hats are cool. So in addition to some of the products you're doing, are you coming out with a whole clothing line or something? Are we going to be able to wear yeah, some? Yeah, you're wearing are we the wear jeans, some aren't you? <laughs> we have some good stuff, so stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. And thank you for all the kind words. That was really, really nice of you. And I'm, I'm very honored to be in this position and to have this chance to lead such a great team of individuals who who all are trying to make a difference and every one of us is trying to make things better for Texans in need. I'm just so thrilled to get that chance. And, and really, thank you for having me on the show because I, I can't wait for your listeners to hear this because it'll help get the word out. And I really appreciate that. Absolutely. And as we say, this is really important. This is really important stuff. If you know anybody that possibly could benefit from this, please like, share it, share it with your friends and family. It's really important. I believe that this will make a huge difference in so many different disease states, and you have an obligation, if you're listening to this, to share this. 100%. That's going to do it for episode number 61. Marcus Ruark, thank you so much. Marcus Ruark from Good Blend, uh, Texas, and this awesome (laughs) hat. That's going to do it for this show. Please like and share. And uh, this is probably one of my, this is definitely one of my top shows. Yeah, this is definitely a top show. Anything you want to say as a parting shot, Marcus? Just thank you. Thank you for setting this up. Thank you for sharing all this information. And thank you for sharing so much about the endocannabinoid system. Right on. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Episode 61. <laughs>